So you have a All right, hello again. Uh, it's been a few weeks since we saw each other last time. Um, now today we will continue what we talked about three weeks ago, so I need to start with a little bit of recapitulation. Um, we, the last lecture and this one is uh, aimed at uh, the maritime transport bit, and uh, today we will do a little bit more interactivity than we did the last time, which means that uh, in the second hour today um, we will spend most of the time on uh, some sort of an in-class group assignment. So we'll try to vary it a little bit. A three-hour monologue is, is not the best way of teaching, I think. This lecture is partly based on, uh, on uh, material developed by a former colleague of ours, Naima Said. She she left the college this summer, but, uh, but part of um, what's in the presentation and, and also what's in your curriculum. Um, a reader on maritime logistics uh, is developed by her. So, what are we going to talk about today? Last time we, we looked at um, the structure of the maritime industry. We looked at uh, ship types and things like that, and some uh, trends and trade statistics and so on. This time, the main focus is on the ports, the land side of maritime transport. Uh, we'll focus on the role of the ports, how it has been traditionally and how it has developed eventually. Different port types, functions, operations, strategies, trends, and also um, this specific focus on current developments. And it's the last part that you are actually going to teach me and not the other way around. Because you will be given in the second hour some recent uh, market data or statistics and you're supposed to present that to the rest of the class during the next hour. Okay. Um, but since it's been two or three weeks since uh, the last lecture on maritime issues, let's uh, spend uh, a few slides on recaps uh, of uh, the maritime issues. Um, we stated the fact that maritime transport is much more diversified than, uh, than the land-based modes. Um, a truck is more or less a truck, whereas vessels are come in very many different shapes and sizes and, and with different purposes. So there's no such thing as a standard vessel. And we did a brainstorming of categories of vessels and we could categorize them into some broad categories. Dry and wet bulk, wet bulk also called tankers, containers, row row, general cargo, specialized vessels. We identified a few trends. Um, the fact that except for the big crude oil tankers, um, the average size of vessels increases in all categories. But if you look at the maximum ship size, uh, they don't grow anymore for the dry bulkers either. So uh, it's only in the other sectors, in particular in the container transport sector, that ship sizes um, increase, the maximum size of them. So this is partly driven by economies of scale and a hub and spoke system. Now, what was the hub and spoke system again? Anyone who cares to try to define it? Please. Instead of having ships going from, uh, directly from each port, you have them going into one main port where everything is put on a big boat that goes through a, to a new hub and then it's um, displayed up in small shipments here. Right. So you have a system where you feed cargo into the big international hubs and then you are able to utilize the, the biggest vessels on the trunk routes, the, the major routes from one uh, part of the world to the other. Now, um, there are three major trade routes um, in the container transport. One is Trans-Pacific. Uh, most typically from Asia or China in particular to the west coast of the United States. 
uh, transatlantic where uh, we uh, would have South America to Europe, for instance, or the other way around. Uh, and then we have the Asia-Europe connection, which is mainly going through the Suez Canal at the moment, but there could be changes to that eventually. Now, we also looked at um, the source of different um, cargo types. And the major sourcing areas for the bulk cargoes were identified. Uh, and for oil transports, it's um, dominated by the Middle East as the major exporting region. Um, but increasingly also African uh, countries in North and West Africa. Uh, North Sea oil is on the decline, but it's still significant in a regional perspective. And then you have Venezuela uh, as a major um, exporter in South America. Um, Russia and Mexico are also major exporters, but they uh, tend to rely on pipelines more than, than sea transport. We looked at the sourcing areas for iron ore, which uh, were the biggest ones are Australia and South America and Canada. And coal has a similar type of origin, but, but with a slightly more widespread sourcing area. Then we identified the key actors in a safety regime or the regulation of shipping. And the key actors there were the flag states which are responsible for um, implementing uh, maritime regulations. Classification, um, they have um, a role as the ones who are sort of testing the seaworthiness of the vessels and, uh, and whether they uh, comply with all rules and regulations. Ship owners, of course, um, they have the ultimate responsibility for the vessels. Uh, but increasingly, also the port states are an important member of the regulatory regime. And they verify the implementation and the enforcement of the regulations through a cooperative system, which we call the port state control system. In Europe, this is organized in something called the Paris Memorandum of Understanding. And we, we looked at some statistics on, uh, on uh, how ships have been controlled and, uh, and possibly also detained if they needed to be held back for, for corrections. Finally, um, the areas of global shipping policies. Uh, we identified the fact that this is a global business and that we need global regulations in order to to uh, make them efficient. Uh, it's uh, more difficult to evade regulations if they are global rather than regional. And of course, uh, this will also be a more cost efficient approach from a ship owner's point of view. If you had different regulations in different parts of the world, it would be difficult to have vessels or operations that comply with, with uh, all sorts of different regulations. Now, the major areas of shipping, international shipping policies or regulations are safety and security. Uh, for instance, the safety of the sailors uh, and the vessels and security issues related to piracy or anti-terrorist attacks. And then the other big category of regulations pertains to environmental issues. Traditionally, with emissions to sea, uh, increasingly with a focus on emissions to air. Yeah, we've already stated that the port states have um, become more uh, central in this regulatory regime. And the latest developments with uh, environmental uh, regulations are new standards for emissions of nitrogen oxides and sulfur. Uh, and uh, especially in the so-called environmental control areas, where the North Sea is one of them. Um, there are many remaining issues. We have focused uh, a little bit on, uh, on the fact that CO2 is still not regulated directly uh, through this uh, regime, and uh, shipping is not part of the Kyoto Protocol, for instance. 
Okay, that was the recap. Now, before we start on the port side, let's uh, spend two or three slides on, on some general um, uh, and quite interesting figures. Uh, this first one is uh, uh, mapping economic development stages of nations and logistics costs per gross national product. So it's a relative measure of logistics costs uh, divided by the value of the total economy. And you can see the different stages of development of uh, nations mapped up here. Of course, you can always discuss whether some of these countries would belong further to the right or to the left, but this is um, uh, one way of putting it. And the general picture here is that logistics costs as a percentage of the, the total economy seems to be higher for the agricultural and mining and industry, uh, industrial countries, rather than the, the mass consumption uh, type uh, of uh, countries down here. Now, could you think of any reasons why this, this has this, this curve is shaped like this? It could be at least a couple of different reasons. Why would you find these countries up here? With a high share of logistics costs. If you, if you just interpret logistics costs as transport costs for, for, for the case of simplicity here now, just think of it as transport costs per uh, gross national product unit. Yes? Um, the countries to the left have to transport their goods to the countries to the right. Okay. Which means that they have maybe a long way to the markets. Okay, yes, now I agree. Uh, it's the type of commodity they trade in. What, what is the characteristics of the commodities that are typically traded within these sectors? It's pretty heavy and low value in terms of value per ton. And of course the value enters into the gross national product. So. Uh, if it's low, the commodities are low value, it tends to lower the gross national product. And if it's heavy, it tends to increase the transport costs. Yes, I agree. This is uh, one and possibly the most important uh, explanation, but there is another one. Linked to what kind of drivers are behind the logistics costs, or let's say transport costs. Is there a driver behind these costs that would be significantly different for these countries compared to these? Keywords infrastructure. Would you expect some differences there? Roads is one element of infrastructure. It could be that uh, uh, if you have uh, a lower quality uh, infrastructure, that this will drive logistics costs as well. So uh, in uh, some of these countries, you may have uh, roads that um, would be uh, less suitable for some transport needs and therefore there will be a drive towards higher logistics costs as well. Okay, now switching to some very uh, recent figures on these major trends uh, or trades that we identified uh, in the beginning here. Uh, now we're focusing on container routes and um, here it's divided into the east, west and the north, south and the intra-regional ones. So it's not exactly the same division as we had to begin with, but here are the east-west routes and they are 
the biggest ones, constituting some 40%, 41% of the total world trade of container units. And this east-west trades could be then further divided into transatlantic or trans-Pacific is the biggest one. Then the Europe Far East is the second one. And then the Far East uh, and Middle East to South Asia. And the Europe to Far East. It's not going across the land, but around the US. So 40% of the world trade in containers is east-west uh, type of um, routes. And then you have the north-south ones, which constitutes a further 17%, um, with uh, some links, North America, Latin America, Europe, Latin America, Europe, Africa, and so on. And finally, you have the intra-regional uh, trades, which is significant. Um, some 42%, so it's more or less on par with the east-west trades. And intra-Europe, intra-Asia is definitely the biggest one. And then a little bit intra-North America, intra-Latin America. Now, both this one and the first one constitutes some 41%. Does this mean that they are equally important, let's say, from a ship owner's point of view? Would you say that the east-west container routes or the intra-regional container routes, are they just as important? Or could there be reasons for saying that one is more important than the other? It's the same total, val uh, total throughput, some 41-42% in both cases. Which one would you say is more important for the total container market? I think I told you in the first lectures to always check the units behind market share figures. What is unit here? What is the unit behind the percentage? says on the slide, yeah? Uh, TAU. TAUs, which means, anyone? 20 foot equivalency units, which means that the 40 foot there is two TAUs. Uh, but that's only part of the explanation, it's TAUs, but what about TAUs? Is it, it's the number of TAUs handled. If you look at the total demand for ship capacity, would you say that the 69 million TUs here in the east-west or the 70, 71 T million TUs in the intra-regional trades are more or less important? What is the difference? Of course, that could be an element, but we don't have information about that. But there is one information which is sort of implicit here, because it's on maps. Yeah? Exactly. The, the, the average haul or the average transport distance is so much bigger in the east-west than in the intra-regional ones, of course. And this means that from a demand and supply point of view, the first one, although it constitutes 41% of the total containers moved, it's constituting much more of the total demand in the sector. So you should multiply this by the average transport distance, and then perhaps the east, I, I don't know what the result would be, but probably the east-west tra uh, trades would then maybe constitute 60 or 70% of the world market. So again, Always ask when you have market share figures like this, what is the unit behind it? And then you know how to interpret them. Okay, last of the general um, statistics figures. Um, this is also a very recent figure. You can see it's been updated all the way through October now. 
Um, it's the three different graphs here, but uh, the dark blue one is the average spot rate. The, what, the, the freight rate for a container um, on uh, the Asia US West Coast trades uh, over the last, well, four, four or five years. And you can see this blue line here moving. It's uh, starting around $2,000. And then it had a sort of a, a, a small peak in, uh, in 2010 where the price was more than 3000 And then it's been hovering around 2000 more or less since then. So $2,000, um, you can convert that to your local currency. But um, compared to what's in a container, this is, uh, this is a very small uh, figure. I mean, uh, if you divide that, I don't know how many TV sets that fits into a 40-foot container, but it's, it's quite a lot. And if you divide this freight rate by the value which is in the container, it is probably in the area of 1% or 2% or something like that. But the general picture is that it's been fairly stable. Um, uh, if we had the graph extended further downwards beyond the credit crunch, which happened, when was this credit crisis? When did we have the credit markets collapsing? Ah, a little bit before. Eight. In eight, in, in the summer of 2008. So we're here in October 09. So if it was extended one year, you would see rates that were much higher than this. So it depends on the perspective, of course. OK. Now, the port. Well, the word port means gate uh, from Latin. Um, there has been some. Uh, early definitions uh, of the ports and, uh, and there is one in your reader uh, referred to already from 1914 where um, one British writer says that on the continent they regard the port as a ga gateway for the country's trade and, and wider, uh, the wider uh, and open the gate and the smoother the road the greater will be the trade. So the point is that it was identified as a key element of uh, a country's uh, ability to trade and, and to prosper. Um, we don't want to bother you with too many definitions of a port. You, you basically have an idea what a port is, but it's generally an interface between maritime transport and inline, inline, inland transport. And, uh, but it's also increasingly a space that could be used for wider logistics uh, type of services. We divide uh, between ports and, and terminals, uh, and uh, whereas a port is sort of a facilitating the transfer of uh, passengers and vessels uh, to other vessels or other modes of transport or to the shore side. Um, the amount of the cargo is defined as the port's throughput and may be counted in different terms. Passengers, tons, TUs, cubic meters if it's gas and so on. But it could also be value terms. One port may constitute several terminals and a terminal is then a physical sort of subsection of the port, a part of the port, typically dealing with one specific, more specialized type of operations like a container terminal, for instance, which would then be one of several terminals within one port. These terminals may be owned by the port authorities or by private investors. Um, they may be fully independent or linked to the operators, as we shall see later on today. It has been estimated that more, some 90% of the world trade is handled through ports, so, so this is uh, definitely an essential part of the world trade system. Um, and it's also been identified as one of the main areas for 
cost and efficiency gains in, uh, in uh, world trades because they are so central. Um, we could define several entities as port users, uh, but um, basically uh, it's the ones that utilize the port for moving uh, the cargo. And we could uh, identify carriers, uh, shipping lines, truck operators and train operators as well. Although these are land-based, they typically pick up and deliver the cargo uh, within the port. Shippers or cargo owners that provide the cargo and uh, a number of logistic service providers. Of course, also passengers, but that's our, not our major focus here. Now, um, we could divide the different services in a port in some primary uh, ones and some secondary ones. The primary ones would be um, uh, the, the providers of terminal services. Uh, Steve doors are the ones that are handling the cargo. It used to be a lot of manual labor in the old days. Now, stevedore companies are using heavy machinery to move the cargo. Ship agents are the ones that uh, take care of all the practicalities that a uh, vessel needs when it uh, comes to a port, uh, to book uh, uh, slot times and to to uh, make sure they get fuel or water and all the supplies they need and, uh, and uh, tugs and, and things like that. Then you have customs brokers dealing with uh, uh, handling the cargo that is imported or exported. Uh, companies that do pilotage and towage. Dredging may be part of the port in some ports, in particular the ports that are situated on, uh, on the estuaries of rivers, where you have a lot of sediments, a lot of sand and uh, gravel, um, which eventually makes the port uh, too shallow. Then they have, in some ports, have an ongoing dredging uh, service, which is sort of picking up the sediments and sand and making sure that uh, the sailing depth is uh, adequate at any time. And then you have uh, some government representatives, um, customs officers, and, uh, and things like that. Okay. Um, ports are also regarded very central in the national infrastructure. Um, so this means that there's a lot of political involvement in the, in the port policies. Um, and there are at least three reasons for that. As we already stated, ports are the major link with the world economy for many countries uh, and therefore are very crucial to the supplies of, uh, of a lot of goods uh, for uh, many countries. But they are also increasingly been seen as hubs for regional development, meaning that um, any nation would like to have one or more big ports in order to attract a lot of economic activity. Once you have a lot of cargo passing through the port in your country, it's easier to develop related industries. And therefore, um, nations are competing, uh, trying to support their ports uh, that are competing with other nations' ports. So this means that um, um, Germany would be very much in favor that, uh, that the ports of Hamburg or, or Bremen or, and so on would be able to compete with the port of Rotterdam or Le Havre and so on. And the French authorities would support their ports and so on. Of course, this is a competition, not only between ports, but between nations and attracting business. But then, especially traditionally, but still, they also play an important role from a naval or military or strategic perspective, which means that uh, it's not only left to the markets, it means that some nations see that this, this needs to be handled as a strategic um, element of their economy. So in case of a political crisis, a uh, potential war situation, ports are extremely important. And therefore, they are also regulated uh, to a large extent. Okay. Container terminals and containers. We have talked a little bit about this before. 
um, they have increasingly become the most uh, important element of many ports. Um, as we have mentioned earlier, containerization started in the 50s and 60s uh, in the US, but took off from the 70s onwards. And now most of the general cargo is containerized. Um, these containers are relatively uniform boxes, um, come in a wide variety, but, but quite a lot of them are standardized. And uh, the purpose of them is, of course, easy and fast handling, uh, but also uh, protection against weather and pilferage. Um, <coughs> yeah. It's difficult to, to provide some sort of a universal definition of, uh, of ports because since they differ uh, quite a lot, both with respect to size and, and to type of operation. Um, and, but there are, has been a trend that ports now, being a part of global logistics networks, have extended their services quite a bit over the last decades. Um, these are sort of the core uh, functions of a port that any port would have to handle somehow. Uh, it's of course about the basic infrastructure. Um, sometimes ports are situated on the coast, sometimes they are si situated somewhere inland with channels or rivers uh, in the approach. And they may have to uh, have shelter against the weather uh, and uh, so on. Then on top of that, you need some superstructures, something built on top of the land areas, which is uh, facilities for, for storage and workshops and offices. Uh, then you will have to have a basic uh, service level for servicing the vessels, including pilotage, towage, uh, and so on. And finally, of course, some services related to the cargo itself but this could vary quite a bit with the size of the port. We could identify some four stages of port development. Um, up until the 1960s, the first generation of ports, uh, where the focus was only handling cargo in the interface between land and sea, that was the basic function. Then eventually, along with the containerization and so on, uh, it also became um, uh, a focus on, uh, on um, uh, multimodal transports. Then we can identify two further developments uh, from the 1980s onwards. Containerization increased, uh, more focus on intermodalism and growing requirements of, of international trade. And now, in the last decade or two, uh, sort of a fourth generation could be identified where ports are linked to each other through terminal companies that own terminals in many ports and, uh, and enter into worldwide uh, networks. So they're not independent anymore, although the ports may be independent, the terminals are typically linked to each other. Uh, this is just a tabular way of, of describing these generations of ports uh, with some elements here. The cargo has been increasingly unitized uh, over this period. Um, we have gone from a typical um, focus on, uh, on uh, the core businesses to expanded logistics uh, 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 type of uh, operations. Uh, with a bigger scope of, uh, of logistics uh, functions. Um, they used to be publicly owned independent unit, uh, 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 units in, back in the first generation, but has increasingly um, entered into to big networks and also with more private ownership uh, eventually. It has also moved from uh, a very labor uh, intensive type of operation towards a more capital in intensive and now also uh, knowledge, know-how uh, and uh, 
and uh, IT kind of type of services have become more focused. So, from labor intensive to more capital intensive, as more services have become automated, more and more expensive handling equipment, like these big gantry cranes, for instance, have uh, become a necessity for, for the bigger ports. Um, these require much less in terms of labor input, but uh, more and uh, bigger financial muscles. And this is partly the driver behind the development towards more public-private partnerships. Uh, because um, public authorities have problems raising enough money for the necessary investments, private actors have been uh, invited into the development of the port and in particular uh, specific terminals. Yeah. Port owners, shipping lines, terminal operators, cargo owners, we have been through this before. Um, another way of categorizing ports is through the type of ownership. Um, generally, the ports need to um, uh, play three different roles. Um, and the first uh, um, type of role they, they have is as a port authority, um, where or um, there are three different ways of dealing with the, with the tasks they, they have. They could uh, have the traditional model of, uh, of uh, um, owning and, and operating everything themselves. The opposite extreme would be to outsource uh, almost everything. But most ports have a mix of public and private ownership and control. The ports are supposed to fulfill a regulatory function, a landowner function, and an operator function. And we'll have a look at each three of those. Um, the primary role of a port authority is actually to, um, uh, to fulfill the regulatory function. And this means that they are the ones who could, could outsource or could, uh, could involve others in, in uh, taking care of parts of the, the operations of the port. Uh, but the land-owning function of the port has become more and more important. Quite a lot of the ports of the world uh, has control over significant and very valuable land areas. So in many ports which used to be very close to, to bigger cities, the value of this land has been uh, extreme. And this means that, that many ports has uh, actually uh, developed the land for other purposes and then instead moved um, some of its uh, operational business out of the big cities. Um, for the Norwegians, you know that the port of Oslo, for instance, uh, has recently um, sort of narrowed down the, their need for land and developed big residential areas. And this is typical for many city ports of the world. Uh, they these land areas are extremely attractive also for property developers. But as land owner functions, they, they need to have a responsibility for developing the, the value of, of these land areas. Uh, they are the ones who need to take care of development strategies and, and, and to supervise and guide some major engineering works and coordinate marketing for the port um, and uh, maintain the physical structures um, which uh, and this is the the landowner functions. In addition to that they also have um, responsibilities for having uh, good access to the land-based transport modes. And then the third and final function of a port is the operational one which deals with the physical transfer of goods and passengers and this is uh, the part which is most often privatized to some extent. In a table form we could sort of divide these three, uh, these three responsibilities of a port as a regulator, as a landowner and, 
as an operator. Uh, and then look at the type of ownership or responsibility here. The traditional model in most parts of the world has been that everything was at some stage totally publicly owned and controlled. Uh, increasingly, one has invited private ownership into some sort of a private, public-private partnership, which both of these models are. Um, some of them have the emphasis on public still, where um, the public port authorities still take care of the regulator uh, functions and the landowner functions, but have privatized only the terminals or the operator functions. Whereas others have gone further to privatize also the landowning functions. And you have a few, but it's not very common worldwide to have a totally privatized port sector. You may find some totally private ports, typically uh, industrial ports for bulk transports and so on. But there is one nation in Europe that has gone further than anyone else in the privatization of ports. Could you guess which one this is? And it probably happened slightly before you were born, so. <laughs> it happened in the late 70s, beginning of the 80s. Then one nation in Europe privatized all its ports. And it's due to a quite famous lady which also had a movie about her. In England? In England or the UK, yes. And the lady I was referring to? Uh, Margaret, Thatcher. Margaret Thatcher, former Prime Minister. She privatized a lot of the UK businesses, including the ports. So they are still, the UK ports are still private. And we could have different lectures on the effects of that, but we'll leave it in there. Okay, yeah, I think we'll, I'm looking at the time, we'll skip this one. Um, now the question is whether this involvement of private money actually enhances the efficiency of the port. Does it get better if you um, uh, privatize things? Unfortunately, you couldn't tell by just pure economic theory to, to, to make a decision that, uh, that public or private ownership is, is better. Um, one could use a part of the economic theory which is called principal agent theory to argue that it's likely that private ownership would be more efficient than public. But there are different empirical evidence and if you look at uh, some of the articles mentioned here, uh, you will find that uh, they do not agree whether it's better or not from an efficiency point of view, to have a private or public ownership. And this goes for many sectors. Uh, if you look at uh, public transport, for instance, there is no firm evidence that one model is significantly better than the other. There are many factors um, uh, affecting this. Okay. Um, yeah. I think we'll skip further ahead and look at... Okay, now just a few words about this. Um, traditionally, uh, back in... Uh, uh, well, towards the very end of the last century, uh, we had uh, a typical model where also the, the port, uh, the operator functions were also uh, within the public ports uh, domain and examples were at that time, uh, well, it was a bit earlier than the last part uh, in London and in the U many US ports. Um, the port authority itself, i.e. The, the publicly owned ones, uh, operated the terminals. But then uh, Rotterdam was one of the uh, first to engage uh, private money in, in developing uh, its uh, uh, port infrastructure, and this also happened in, in some other um, countries. Um, one could have both models in the same port, and uh, one example is the port of Karachi in Pakistan, where uh, you have both a privately owned 
container terminal and one container terminal owned by the public port. So you have sort of hybrid models as well. Uh, and uh, you can have different uh, ways of organizing this, uh, involving more or less of private money into it. Um, the recent development is that you have a lot of global actors coming into the operations of terminals. And uh, the, um, over the last years, you have a lot of transnational or even global terminal operating companies coming into the market. And here, let's end this hour by having a brief look at these statistics. These are container terminal operating companies and you have measured their market shares in three different years, 2001, 2006 and 2009. And uh, the top one in all these years is something called Hutchison Port Holdings. They're owning uh, a lot of terminals in major ports around the world and uh, the market share has increased from some 11-12% up to 13 to 14 over these years. Uh, then you have PSA is the Port of Singapore Authority. So you would think that the Port of Singapore is only running Singapore business, but they're also investing in many other ports of the world, so they have a network of terminal companies. Um, they were number two back in 2001, they're down to number three now, but they still have a very significant share. And the third one is AP Muller. Anyone who knows AP Muller? What what they are linked to, which shipping operator? It's, it's Danish. Yes? Maersk. Maersk. It's the mother company of Maersk. So, uh, AP Muller Terminals uh, is also one of the worldwide operators. And you can see that these three big ones all have a market share of some 11 to 14 uh, percent. And you can see at the bottom line here that the top 10 container companies have represented 41.5% of the market back in 2001. Eight years later, they represent 64.6% .6 of the market. This is what we call market consolidation, meaning that fewer actors take a bigger market share. So that's pretty, a pretty dramatic change in only eight years. They're grabbing 25% more almost, or 23, 4% more of the total world market in just eight years. So this has been a very rapid development and it has also increased a lot in the latest years. So this figure is slightly old. Uh, so my guess is that this market share may be around 70 now. Okay. It's time for a break, and uh, after the break, we will uh, do this in class exercise. So let's break for 12 minutes, shall we?